Representative Gary Smith. Um, Gary has been in the um, South Carolina House Representative District 27 since 2003. He is a chairman of the House Operations and Management Committee, member of the House Ways and Means, and chairman of the Property Tax Subcommittee. He is also a businessman. He is a managing partner of two different businesses specializing in economic development, general management, comprehensive planning, and zoning. He holds a bachelor's degree and also an MPA from the University of South Carolina. How, how do you feel, Gary, about being surrounded by all these tiger paws here? <laughs> Are you okay? All right. He has held many governmental and planning positions, including past administrator of Bamberg County and the city of Simpsonville. He has also has served as the assistant administrator of Aiken County. His honors and recognitions are too numerous to list, but um, Gary is married with two children, and in addition, I don't want to tick him off, because he has a black belt and a bronze certif he's a bronze certified wrestling coach. So would you please welcome Representative Gary Smith. Thank you, I appreciate that very much. Appreciate it. I don't want to make you mad. <laughs> Trust me, you won't make me mad. Welcome. Hello. How's the uh, conference been so far? Everybody had a good time? Everybody enjoyed it? You learned a lot? These ladies have done a fantastic job of putting this together. Uh, and you to be applauded for that. Give them a big hand. Now let me also applaud you for the work that you're doing because one of the things that is so vitally important to our representative system of democracy is what? Citizen involvement. Citizen involvement. In, in citizen engagement, citizen knowing and being involved and having the resources and all to be involved and to help them make an, have an influence upon what, what they do. And citizens in action is one of the ways you can go about doing that. 17 inches, 17 inches wide. Who can tell me what, se what is 17 inches wide? Always has been, always will be, no matter what level. On plate, exactly. It doesn't matter if it's little league baseball. It doesn't matter if it's high school. It doesn't matter if it's college or pro. Home plate is 17 inches wide. It doesn't matter what your abilities are, but if you can't get it across 17 inches wide, then you're probably not gonna be a very good pitcher. Wouldn't you say that? All right? That's accountability. And too often we take and say, well, you know, we feel sorry for you. You know, you, you're not quite good enough to be a pitcher, so we may take and expand that plate out to 20 inches. Okay? Think about that. We do that in so many things nowadays. But not in baseball. And that's a good lesson for us. It really is when you think about it. That is a standard that has been accepted. Again, no matter whether you're in little league, high school, college, or pro, it's 17 inches wide. Everybody's got to abide by that. Why would you change it? Why would you try to make it easier for someone to take and get that ball across the plate? We do that too often in government. We do that too often as citizens with our government. That's why these sorts of conferences and these sorts of programs that give you the ability to take and to engage in a knowledgeable way with your government, because it is your government, is so vitally important. Because after all, it's only 17 inches wide and it should be that way, and we should abide by it. We should always keep it that way. And that's what we get away from so often. 
As Jim DeMint uh, said in his book, Why We Whisper, one of the things that we do a lot is we get intimidated. Whether it's by the slap principle that he talks about in his book, which can continue to take and harass you and sue you and other things like that to take and make you shut up, or whatever means, because after all, it wasn't these lawsuits, losing any lawsuits that made the Boy Scouts change their tradition they've had for how long? Over 100 years. It was just that they got slapped so many times, they finally threw up their hands and, and said, we quit. And too often we do that same thing in government. We throw up our hands and say, okay, we give up. We're not going to pray anymore. We're not going to allow you to pray in school anymore. That's why it's so important that you be involved. One of the critical things that I think that we need to make sure is in place is we need to make sure that our churches are involved. Because one of the things that our churches has had happen to them is that they've been slapped around a lot. And they have finally said, okay, we give up. We don't want to participate anymore. And what does that lead? That leaves a void of who is going to be out there growing and teaching and developing our leaders in this country, as well as who's going to be the moral compass for this country. We've got to put an end to those sorts of things. We've got to stop. We've got, you've got to do that as citizens. This wasn't what I was supposed to talk about today, but I wanted to kind of lead into what I was going to talk about because it's not a real sexy subject. It's talking about budget and finances, and I'm going to follow up a little bit upon what uh, uh, Diane said about registration by party. But I wanted to emphasize this is why you're here today. This is what you're supposed to be doing. This is what more. I'm disappointed because there are not more of you here to be involved in things like this. We need to have more of these. We need to have more people involved in this. Because I really do feel like we're at a crisis point. We're in a situation in our country that we're, we're getting ready to go off a cliff. We could go off a cliff that we're not going to come back from. And the only way that's going to stop and going to turn around is, is through you and your involvement. I'm not going to be able to take and do it. You're going to have to do that. Joe Deal's not going to be able to do it in Greenville County. You're going to have to do that. You're going to have to take back over your government and bring it back into line. One of the good things about South Carolina and most in all the states in, in the United States is that we are required to stay within those 17 inches. Rex, you're on Ways and Means Committee. You know exactly what I'm talking about. One of the things that we're required to take and do is that we're not allowed to take and spend more money than we actually bring in. We have a constitutional requirement to balance our budget every year. And if we don't, we're required to do what? Right off the top, first of the next year, we're supposed to take and replenish those dollars and to balance the budget. Federal government is not. Never right, Rick? What the Convention of States is all about. Trying to get at that issue there. A movement that has been really put together by citizens in this country to take and lead and to get that done. Which is what is supposed to happen. Which is why we have things like this. To educate people about doing those sorts of things. And when you think about the state budget, one of the things that you have to do first is what? You have to look at how many dollars you're getting? What are the dollars you've got to take and expend? Because you can't spend a dollar more than one time, right? One time. So it's very important to know where your dollars are coming from and what those dollars look like. And we've got a handout. Did we, Scott, did we already pass that out? Okay, everybody's got that? It gives you a little synopsis about what the state budget looks like coming into the House Ways and Means Committee. Gives you a little idea about that. But I want to talk with you a little bit about some of the things that are not really covered there 
in that. This will give you a good idea about the dollars and so forth and some of the highlights of it and some of the, the things that, are, that the money is going toward as it came out of the Ways and Means Committee that we will discuss next week on the House floor. Well, let's talk about those dollars, that pot of money you've got to take and spend. Everybody's heard we got $1.3 billion in additional revenue to spend this year. You know where it came from? Anybody have any idea where it came from? What, that dollar, what those dollars make up? I got a cheat sheet over here. It's going to tell me what, the, what it is. It's broken up into two really basic funds. One is recurring dollars and one is non-recurring dollars. Recurring dollars are those dollars that come back every year that you can expect to be in the budget the following years, right? Those are things that you want to try and use going toward regular operational expenses. Those things that you expect to have expenses every year for. Your people, your, your vehicles, or your gas and things like that. Operational sorts of issues. You want to have recurring dollars going toward those things. The other is non-recurring dollars. Dollars that you're not expecting to have come back in the future years. Those are things you don't want to have to go into your regular operations, correct? Because you can't depend upon them. Those are not coming back again the following years. So you want to have the recurring dollars going toward those operational expenses and the non-recurring dollars going toward what? Capital equipment, things like that, are the not recurring expenses. So it's very important out of that $1.3 billion dollars to know exactly what is what. Well, you've got about $767 million in reoccurring dollars that will be coming back from various sources. One of it comes back from 2014-2015 budget. Those were once we closed the books on that, uh, we, the, the, the Comptroller General's office said you've got additional monies that came in that weren't spent. Another is uh, monies that came in from 2015-16 budget that weren't spent. And then you have a little over $300 million that come in that we know that uh, because of revenue increases from the growth of the economy in the state for this year. That's what makes up that $767 million that we got to expend. So when you look at things such as road funding, which is an ongoing expense, what do you look toward to take and use for those dollars? You look at the reoccurring dollars. Those dollars you expect to be back in future years, correct? It's an ongoing expense. So you're looking at that $767 million. This is what you've got to take and to play with and to work with on that. That's where you are in the budget when you look at uh, those sorts of things. We will be taking up that on the uh, House floor next week starting to take and digest and starting to take and work on that. The Senate version of the uh, bill that came back on the roads funding had a uh, appropriation for $400 million in road funding uh, as a part of that. It didn't designate where it was going to come from, reoccurring, non-recurring. It just said $400 million every year. So you'd think it would need to be out of reoccurring dollars. So we need to figure out some way to take and do that. We'd already appropriated almost $300 million in the House uh, Ways and Means budget toward roads. We had also set aside about $130 million for tax reductions. Those two things right there is $430 million, reoccurring dollars that can go toward that right there. As Larry Gatlin says, it ain't rocket surgery, guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you have to do is you have to look at those sorts of things. If you're going to look at something that's sustainable, because we heard a lot about that, what do mean, people mean by sustainable? Something that's more of a dedicated sort of a, a, a revenue source toward DOT and toward road funding, then you can take and do that. One of the things we've done uh, two of the th last three years in South Carolina, we've taken and started to move the sales tax dollars for motor vehicles over into the Department of Transportation. Well, anybody who knows anything about the sales tax dollars, that's do those are dollars that are required to go toward what in South Carolina? Education. Education. So if you take those dollars out and you put them in the Department of Transportation trust fund, then what do you got to do? You got to replace that hole in, in education 
in New Orleans they can do that. So we've done that over a period of uh, uh, two, three years now. We'll finish that up this year. $65 million of that, almost $300 million is, is, is that replacing those dollars uh, in the education fund for those monies being moved over into the Department of Transportation uh, Trust Fund. That's what that is. So that's what's happening, what's happening there. The problem that I see with the road issue is the governance side of it. And one of the things that I have always committed to doing is doing what first? Reform DOT first. We took a step toward that five years ago, six years ago almost now, uh, with that with the revision of Act 114 where we set up the department as a candidate agency and allowed the governor to take and to appoint the, depart the uh, department director, which is now the transportation secretary for the state of South Carolina. That sunsetted last year. We continued it forward with a budget proviso this past year. Budget provisos last for how long, Rex? One budget year. That's it. The budget is over with. It's gone. So that sunset. What the Senate did is they, they took and said, okay, we're going to let the governor take and appoint the commissioners and let the commissioner take and appoint the uh, secretary of transportation. What I'm afraid of is that if we were to take and to make an amendment to that particular restructuring part of the, uh, their budget or their bill they sent back to us, or our bill that they sent back to us, then it's going to go into a conference committee and it's going to die there. And what will happen is that the appointment of the transportation director will then go back to the commissioner with that sunset. And restructuring takes a step backwards instead of a step forward. So then you've got money out there without the restructuring. That really concerns me. Right now, we've got some restructuring that, are out, that is out there to deal with. And I hope we deal with it in a responsible way, and I hope we can get that done. It troubles me and concerns me to put dollars toward DOT without the assurance of that restructuring being in place. That really bothers me. I am really struggling with that going into Monday's votes on the budget. That gives you somewhat of a synopsis. I got four minutes left to talk about <laughs> registration by party. Diane talked with you about what the, uh, the group has been doing on registration by party, which I applaud them for taking and doing that. It's something I have been working on for the last 13 years. I had a bill that we got through subcommittee in the House Judiciary Committee, got out on the uh, Judiciary Committee floor. It wasn't pretty, but it gave me something that I could get a vote in Judiciary Committee and was moving, wanting to move it out to the full floor. When I got it on the full floor, I could fix what they had done in subcommittee because it wasn't going to happen in Judiciary Committee. Why? Because we've got a lot of en enemies in the legal profession, which is what mostly makes up the Judiciary Committee in Judiciary Committee. The present chairman of the Judiciary Committee fought me on that and got it killed in Judiciary Committee mainly because our folks fought me also on it and got it killed in Judiciary Committee, full committee, because it didn't look pretty in the committee. So I wasn't able to get it out on the floor. That's probably the best chance that we've had. Well, I know it's been the best chance we've had in the last 13, 14 years that I have been there. I don't see us getting anything more done on it. And why is that important? Well, let me give you an example of why that's important. We hold a series of town hall meetings in um, uh, my district and the uh, surrounding area uh, every year. The first one is always in Fountain Inn. We held it uh, last month uh, there in Fountain Inn. There's a gentleman that comes to that meeting or comes to our town hall meetings on a regular basis. He's very, very religious about it, which is a pun, no, no doubt, because this gentleman is also the head of the separation of church and state group for the state of South Carolina. He is also, and he told me at the uh, Fountain Inn meeting, he said, I asked, was talking with him and asked him about uh, who is supporting the president. I'm supporting Bernie Sanders. That also tells you a little about Chris, okay? 
He was asking me, well, who are you supporting? I was telling him that I supported Scott Walker to begin with, and I was now supporting uh, Ted Cruz, and we're working on that. And he said, well, next week I'm going out, I'm going, I'm going to vote too in the Republican primary. You going to vote in the Republican primary? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to vote for Ted Cruz also because I think he's the person that we can beat. That was Chris Allison. You know who I'm talking about, don't you, Joe? Who every time I go on to the uh, Christian Talk radio show, calls in. Every time we have a town hall meeting, he's there. Folks, this is the people that we're dealing with. They are engaged. They're not dummies either. He sees an opportunity to take and to participate in my last 49 seconds in our process in the Republican Party and help choose our nominees for us. And if you think he's the only one doing that, you are sadly mistaken. That is why also it's so important that you're doing what you're doing here today, that you're participating, that you're getting involved, that you're getting educated so that you can go out there and deal with the Chris Allisons of the world. So that you can compete with them on an equal footing. Because I really do believe that we are really close to the edge. And it's your responsibility, not mine solely, but yours, to take and see that we don't go over that edge. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here with you and an honor. Thank you, Diane. Thank you for inviting me.